Welcome to Premier's podcast number 105. And today we're talking about the second half of boundary layers over mountains. So in podcast number 104, we were talking about the first half and that was mainly to do with the unsteadiness in these boundary layers. So effectively, the transportation of different properties of the air uh, around the boundary layer, around the mountains through the boundary layer. So either going horizontally or vertically or a combination of both. In this podcast, we're going to cover the last bit of that, plus now the steady part. And to do that, we're going to look at the last part of this paper called Exchange Processes in Atmospheric Boundary Layer over Mountainous Terrain. And this is open access again, so you can find it in the link in the description. And just a warning to those listening to this, um, if you haven't listened to the first part, you should probably go back to listen to that. Uh, but also, this is going to follow a very similar structure in terms of this paper is very inaccessible in its language, which means that it makes it very difficult for people to understand because they use a lot of very complex terms and in sequence, which makes it just very difficult to, under, to comprehend. So to help you with that, I'm going to do my best to break down these terms and what they mean and using re- words that you know humans use as opposed to non-humans. And hopefully we'll, we'll go along uh, the way and we'll find out that um, it's quite easy to understand after we break it down into simple terms. In addition to that, We've actually got a drawing pad now so we can draw uh, some uh, pictures so we can have some animations. So if you're listening to this, you can also watch the video on YouTube and or Spotify. And that way you can see my cool drawing skills. Um, This is the first time I've used this pad, so I'm not really sure how well it'll come out, but just bear with me as we go along. So let's get into the second part of this podcast. So let's talk about the vertical extent of the convective boundary layer over complex orography. So the convective boundary layer, as I mentioned, was the the part of the boundary layer like this type of boundary layer that changes the properties of air so they transport like density particulates temperatures pressures etc over different regions and complex orography is effectively mountain ranges so just undulations so the multifaceted impact of thermally driven breezes on the structure of the convective boundary layers near mountains makes it challenging to determine its vertical extent so that means is that there are a lot of different parts of the um, convective boundary layer and how these winds transport these different temperatures across mountain ranges. So it's difficult to understand how far they go. So or how high they go. So over flat terrain, the upper boundary layer, the upper boundary of the convective boundary layer is sharply defined. It coincides with the mixing height and depends primarily on the thermal structure of the atmosphere and on the intensity of the turbulence exchange, quantified for instance by the bulk Reynolds the bulk Richardson number. So what this means is the upper boundary of the this convective boundary layer, so this unsteady part, uh, coincides with the mixing height. And what that means is where you get an exchange of, again, momentum in this particular case at a certain height. So once you can figure out what that height is, you can say that, okay, that's probably the, the top of the convective boundary layer. And this depends, they say, primarily on the thermal structure of the atmosphere. So with um, at the atmosphere, typically as you go higher, the temperature drops and you get to a certain point where it drops quite rapidly. And it also depends on the intensity of turbulent exchange. So how much turbulence there is. And they say it's quantified for instance by the bulk Richardson number. So the Richardson number is a non-dimensional number, like for example, the Reynolds number or the drag coefficient or whatever, or straw number. But in this particular case, the Richardson number um, is the ratio of the buoyancy of effects compared to the shearing effects of wind. So what this means is when the Richardson number is above one, you can say that the flow is effectively buoyancy driven, which means that the buoyancy effects are um, pushing whatever's happening. It's, it's making it, that happen. Whereas if it's below one, then you say that it's the shearing effect, whether that's um, flow over a surface or two different velocity flows are over each other. That's what's driving the flow. So that's the demarcation between these two different types of flows. And interestingly, when it's equal to one, they are on the side of saying that it's a buoyancy driven flow, even though technically the buoyancy and uh, shearing forces or effects are unity. And it's also quite interesting because we can draw it back to the Reynolds number where a similar sort of thing happens where <laughs> when you have a Reynolds number, that's the, that, that's the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. So when it's above one, you can say that the viscous forces play a greater role compared to the, uh, sorry, the natural forces play a greater role to the viscous forces. However, it's not until we get to very high Reynolds numbers where we can say that the, the flow becomes very turbulent and turbulence is really due to 
inertial effects, not really due to viscous effects, because viscosity does its best to actually um, suppress turbulence and rob it of its energy to make it all um, very um, de-energetic. De so for example, <laughs> in a real life scenario, let's say you have one person, they have a lot of, they have a lot of food, and then someone else comes to take all their food away. So this, this person has no energy now, and then they just slump down to the ground. In this particular case, the person robbing the other person is viscosity. So that, <laughs> I'm not sure how much that helps you, but um, it's a good little analogy. So that's the end of the unsteady part of the boundary layer. Let's now go on to the stable boundary layer over mountainous terrains. So the stable boundary layer over a valley floor, for example. So we have a picture in figure four and also oh, let's go to figure three first. So we have a little bit more to talk about that. So the multi-layer structure of the daytime atmosphere. So remember from last podcast, the atmosphere or the boundary layers from daytime to nighttime are quite different. And um, depending on where you are, either turbulence can be uh, exacerbated, like encouraged, or can be um, sapped away and made nothing. Remember that robbing analogy that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> so the multi-layer structure of the daytime atmosphere over mountains is often defined is often identified in observations and simulations. For example, LIDAR observations, increasingly used to determine the vertical extent of the convective boundary layer, often, sorry, often reveal elevated aerosol layers. So what that means is these, using LIDAR, they measure where the, like these all, all these particulates in the air, and they find that even when you go very high, you can get a lot of particulates that have come from elsewhere. So that's the convective boundary layer, which makes it a little bit difficult to um, assess where the height of the boundary layer is in terms of the aerosol aspect, but in terms of the um, mixing part, it was a bit easier. So the top of these aerosol layers in figure three, we can see is not always equivalent to the convective boundary layer determined using thermodynamic pro profiles, as we mentioned, and can be a source of confusion when determining a relevant mixing height scale over mountainous terrain. It could be argued that the top of the aerosol layer is a more relevant height scale for mixing processes over mountainous terrain, but its relationship to the traditionally defined convective boundary layer height is largely uncertain. So, so far, much of the focus on daytime boundary layers in mountainous terrain has been on the temporal and spatial evolution of the convective boundary layer as defined in traditional boundary layer studies. Convective boundary layers in valleys and basins have received most of the attention and are relatively well observed and understood compared to the convective boundary layers over slopes and mountain tops. So in the last podcast, we talked about convective boundary layers over slopes and mountain tops. So the, for example, the mountain venting and the mountain cloud venting and the advective layer. So the, the advective venting. So conclusions on whether advection affects the, on whether advection effects make the convective boundary layer height more uniform over mountains differ between observations and theoretical models. So what they're saying is, one of these processes that we mentioned in the last podcast, advective, vent, advective venting, may or may not make the heights of these convective boundary layers more uniform over mountains and they need further study. Now let's move on to figure four. So figure four is to do with the nocturnal boundary layer processes over mountain terrains. So basins and valleys with a flat floor or with blocking obstacles downstream allow for the formation and strong surface bases surface-based inversions and cold air pools. What does that mean? So what they're saying is basins and valleys with flat floors, like flat grounds, or when you have a basin or valley with blocking obstacles, allow or encourage the formation of temperature of thermal inversions and cold air pools. A thermal inversion is when you have colder air near the ground compared to when you go higher because in our atmosphere, as I mentioned, when you go higher, the temperature should drop. But if you get an inversion, then that can um, result in colder air or it results in colder air being closer to the ground and can also result in winds. And it also can result in cold air pools. So uh, if you just think of air as a fluid and not as a gas, then you can sort of approximate it to like how you think of water, where you, water can pull in a certain area. So it can air depending on the temperature or and or pressure. I guess with pressure, you'd have to try to mine. Um, move to a lower pressure region. But with temperature, you can get these pools with of these regions of air that are colder. So that's what that means. The time scale of nocturnal cooling is typically shorter in basins and valleys than it is over flat terrain. So that's a major difference, that's interesting. Stratification in cold air pools decreases turbulence intensities, but 
even in such stable conditions, turbulent mixing is possible. So what that means is when you have the, the air in these cold pools, when they're stratified based on you know, temp uh, maybe temperature, but also pressure and or densities or whatever, or even constituents of the air that can suppress turbulence to some extent. Short-lived mixing events can occur when wind shear across the top of the cold pool becomes strong enough to make the Richardson number subcritical. When this happens, mixing removes momentum from the free atmosphere flow, shear decreases, and the turbulence is suppressed again. So this is all beneficial in terms of reducing um, turbulence. So in figure, f so let's move on to stable boundary layers over slopes now. That was stable boundary layers over valleys and basins. So now over slopes. And again, in podcast number 104, we're talking about how upstream, sorry, upslope to downslope winds are quite different and how um, one is significantly uh, less stable than the other. So let's move on to the stable boundary layers over slopes. And we'll see again, a similar sort of thing happening here. Downslope flows are invariably turbulent for two reasons. The first is the catabatic jet maximum is always very close to the surface, implying that turbulence production is by shear is always large. <laughs> what does that mean? So a catabatic jet is, I'll draw my little, I'll use my little pad here now. So oops, if we have a mountain and a catabatic air or catabatic wind is pretty much just a wind that always goes downstream. So or down the slope. So that's just a fancy name for that. And the reason why they say that it is, uh, the maximum is always very close to the surface is because the air is or it's because of wind very close to the surface so obviously it's going to be faster there that's stating the obvious this they say implying a turbulence production by shear is always large so in other words you're getting a lot of turbulence because you have a fast moving flow if that's the ground you have a fast moving flow and then this is creating a lot of turbulence here because of the shear layer so no matter what you do you're always going to get a lot of turbulence with downslope winds because of this air that is rushing down. Consequently, the atmosphere rarely becomes very stable at slope sides. So you're gonna get a lot of winds. There was a second reason, which is due to buoyant turbulent production, but I'm not gonna go through that because it was, um, they don't really have a conclusion which uh, you can base anything on. So I wanna go through that second reason. However, besides causing significant turbulent mixing, catabatic winds, so downslope winds, advect heat and air mass along the slope. So what they do is they move heat and air down the, the slope. And the coupling between advection and spatial heterogeneity necessarily implies that at any point along the slope, turbulence is not entirely determined by local effects. <laughs> okay. So what they're saying is because you are moving all this air down the slope, the you're not going to be getting um, a homogeneous flow any, or you're not going to be getting all these little um, differences. Like, so for example, the flow up, uphill is going to be different to downhill to begin with, but this air is transporting all these properties downstream or down the hill, which makes the entire flow pretty much very similar. It mixes all these different properties together and you get a more uniform air here then. So that means you're not going to be getting um, turbulence, which is not determined just by local effects, but also by these um, more global effects. The heat budget at one point may be affected by upstream thermal heterogeneity, while changes in the slope roughness and angle may alter the wind speed and therefore the intensity of turbulence downstream, possibly even ca causing flow separation. So in figure four, they have flow separation here over the um, little bump here. They have the flow going downhill and then it reaches, reaches a bump and then it separates like you would over a regular surface as you'd expect and you get some sort of um, recirculation zone here before it reattaches again. So similarly, mixing in the stable boundary layer is affected by the terrain curvature with convex areas being sheltered and therefore less turbulent. So that means that if you want to be in a, um, a more well-behaved area on a hill, go to a convex area, is what I guess they're saying here. Then in figure five, they have a bunch of different um, situations in terms of mountains and the boundary layers going over. I'm gonna cover that now. This is part of the stable layers in valleys. So they say, 
Stable layers in valleys effectively control whether the valley atmosphere is coupled or decoupled with the overlying free atmosphere. So in other words, um, the stable boundary layers can cut off the air in the in the um, valley to the rest of the air above that. So some of the processes that create stable boundary layers over complex orography, so over mountain ranges, also occur over flat and homogeneous terrain. Other relevant processes, however, especially during the daytime, are specific to these boundary layers over these mountainous terrains, such as advective venting, which is when the flow goes up the mountain slope and then shoots up into the rest of the sky. So stable boundary layers, suppress turbulence, resist erosion by wind shear, hinder vertical exchange and control the propagation of gravity wave modes. Gravity waves are um, a fancy term for just a, a macroscopic um, weather front. So these uh, stable boundary layers, again, can isolate whatever's below that from these global events. I say in more practical terms, stable layers below mountain crests control whether the valley atmosphere is sheltered from or exposed to synoptic cross valley flows. So in figure 5a here, they have two mountain ranges, they have two peaks, then in between they have a stable boundary layer forming between the two. That cuts off this flow from what's going on above. And interestingly, between this stable boundary layer and the flow above, you get a lot of turbulence, and that's due to shearing. Inversion, secondly, um, these stable boundary layers, inversion layers above mountain tops control the amplitude and wavelengths of propagating and trapped wave modes. So in other words, the inversion layer, which is due to the thermal uh, inversion of the air, can suppress these macroscopic um, weather fronts from impacting downstream again. This is just a different way of defining it, I guess. Finally, or thirdly, ground-based stable layers control intermittent turbulent exchange in stable boundary layer, effectively turning it off when they are strong enough to decouple the stable boundary layer from the overlying nocturnal jet, suppressing shear turbulence production. So again, they can isolate the rest of the flow from the jets that occur at nighttime, and um, reduce this turbulence. So finally, elevated stable layers trap heat and moisture underneath them. So this is actually something similar to what I was talking about in the last podcast where you get um, air, if you have a mountain range next to the sea, you often get air that goes up over the mountain range and it traps all this air that usually was over the city, for example, in the city. So that's where you get smog. And in combination with horizontal advection towards mountainous regions, Elevated stable layers may thus favor the accumulation of moist static energy within valleys. So what this means is what I mentioned there, where you get all whatever's happening in this valley can't really go anywhere. And you just get this build up of whatever's happening. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. So that's the stable boundary layer that we just covered here. It's slightly different to the convective boundary layer. However, there are some similarities. For example, in this one, they're talking about uh, the advection of of air towards the mountains, which is similar to the advection of the air going up the mountains, but it's not a convective boundary layer because it doesn't move it, I guess, as much. That's the definition they came up with. So that's the end of this paper. There's some more that they go through, which is just due, due to the um, how to actually run computer simulations. I'm not going to go through that because I don't think you'll be that interested. If you are, let me know in the comments and I'll cover that in another podcast. Otherwise, we'll leave this paper here and we'll move on to another topic in the next podcast. And let me know what you think about this one. And if you want to get better at CFD and or theory yourself, check out our courses in the link in the description. And if you want to get better at, or if you want to get uh, better experimental results, check out Atmosphere Hawk because that makes your experiments two to four percent more accurate. And the reason why it does that is because, as you've <laughs> found out in this paper as well, the temperature, pressure, and density of air do change throughout the day and from day to day and from week to week and month to month and season to season. So that means that on a regular day, the density of air will change by, by about 2 to 4%. And then between days and weeks and seasons, you might even get 15% change. If you're not measuring the density of air in your experiments, then you have that error that you don't even know about. And that means that you're probably getting a lot of data that's corrupted without even realizing it. And that's why a lot of things don't line up properly and don't agree with literature. It also makes your CFD harder to validate because the density of air that you're using in your CFD is different to the density of air that you're using that you're you have in your experiments so you can't really get good validation there without even knowing it as well you have to like mash things together and you're not sure why things aren't working so the atmosphere hawk gets rid of the error for you and it makes your experiments much better and more accurate and your cfd more accurate so get one of those link in the description and i'll see you in the next podcast peace out amigos